upstream hetero heterogeneous causes. We um, can know and we can explain these features of a system with this structure without knowing any of the lower level or mechanistic details about what instantiates the causal connections in this system. In fact, you can find the same final common pathway structure in many different domains where these lower level details are extremely different, but um, what you still have is the same kind of implications of this higher level structure. Now, there are, of course, many different types of causal patterns that we find showing up in neuroscience and other scientific contexts. Um, a few of these are examples of a bow tie type structure. We have the final common pathway case and other branching configurations of um, in different types of causal organizations. What's interesting is that each of these different causal structures comes with unique implications. And what's maybe especially important um, with respect to this um, panel is that these higher level causal structures can provide explanations and they can do so without including any of the lower level details. And you might think lower level mechanistic details that are instantiating these structures. Um, so what does this suggest? Um, part of what this um, discussion and interpretation of these cases suggests is that, of course, there are higher level causal structures in neuroscience, higher level causal structures and patterns and details that are explanatory. Um, this pushes back on a reductive view that is suggesting that in order to explain something, you need to reduce down to the lowest level. Um, and in fact, what we see with this type of um, approach is that in many cases, um, it isn't just that the higher level details are explanatory, but they can be more explanatory than the lower level ones. And we see this where the same higher level structure is essentially multiply realized by different lower level details um, across different cases that all can be explained in the same way, that all share that higher level structure and share some other behavior that's produced by and explained by that structure. So part of what we also see with this type of approach is that there are different types of causal structures and causal concepts in neuroscience. Some of the causal structures I mentioned were the final common pathway and bow tie cases, but we also see that there are these different causal concepts that are used and it isn't just mechanism that's driving this work. I also mentioned the pathway concept I think the cascade concept also comes up in this work, and that's another causal term and causal concept that I've looked at in some other work. Um, a bigger picture suggestion is that explanation in neuroscience is a lot more diverse than these mainstream mechanistic accounts have claimed, and it doesn't fit this reductive picture that we sometimes lean into in science and in philosophy. Part of what this suggests and supports is a picture in which there are a diversity of causal structures and a diversity of types of causal explanation in neuroscience. Thank you. Thanks so much. I actually, I lost track here of things because my computer just literally uh, crashed and I couldn't get back on right away. So, but I, I guess I recovered back to the end of your presentation, which unfortunately I missed most of. Uh, Randy, uh, I think that you were next. Yeah. Great. So thanks again, Luis, for organizing this. Um, uh, I like this poem, so I'm going to give you a chance just to read it. Um, I'm still it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but it is kind of nice. <laughs> we don't see your screen, Randy. Why Lauren, not? Lauren, I think maybe your screen is... Well, Lauren, I think you need to unshare yours. There we go. There we go. We see it now. Now you see a poem? Yes. Okay. Poem by Margaret Atwood, um, who you might know as a novelist, but also you probably don't know that she's also a very good poet. And this one has sort of a neuroscience flavor to it, so I thought I'd throw it up for no other reason other than I like the poem, so, um, so it's good. Um, 
So I'm going to make three points today, um, and they do overlap quite nicely with what you just heard from uh, both Lauren and Danny, um, in the sense of that <clears throat> um, if you can understand the causal structure, um, well, in this case, talk about the brain, um, you have a better chance of understanding how the components of the system come together to produce, um, I will, I'll use the word emergent um, sort of cautiously here, um, behaviors that we're measuring um, in cognitive neuroscience and psychology. Um, one of the important uh, principles in how, in the, in the brain sense of the things, but also most complex uh, adaptive systems, is that there's um, a change in the symmetry um, of, of influences. Um, in the case of the brain, it would be symmetry of connections. Um, and the asymmetry um, uh, leads to a causal structure that can support the emergence of unique functional repertoires. Um, and this actually translates across different scales. Um, but in the case of the network levels we're talking about with Danny and Lauren, um, you can think about those as sort of large scale um, properties as well. The figure over here is from my colleague, Victor Yerster, who's been developing a lot of these ideas of, of um, asymmetries um, and how that transpires in a dynamical systems framework. And what we see in, the, in this diagram is that if you have a completely symmetric um, network where all the connections are equally weighted and they're bidirectional, that the space over which this network um, plays and we'll call it the manifold um, is fairly simple and uninteresting. So if you have a uh, perturbation or a process that enters the system, which one of these arrows would be that, as soon as it in engages the network, it basically collapses into a very simple fixed point. So there's nothing really interesting happening because it is a completely symmetric system. Um, when you start breaking symmetry, you can either do that by changing the direction. So that's a unidirectional connection, for example, or changing the weights, limiting connections. In doing that, in invoking the asymmetry, you, always, you then allow um, uh, more interesting dynamics to emerge. So first of all, the dimensionality of the system goes down. And then you have, in this particular case, instead of a flat manifold with no particular features, you have um, different attractors uh, forming. Attractors in this case would be network configurations that, that transverse across um, space and time um, that have some sort of property. So in this case, you'd have a limit cycle would be sort of oscillating, if you will. In this case, you have two fixed points where the network would start um, apart and then converge to a fixed point and then um, move on to the next phase. So asymmetry in the brain in terms of the causal structure is quite an important um, feature. Um, that causal structure in the brain um, has led to the supposition that by understanding the causal structure, you get a better idea of how that causal structure leads to capacity or uh, you know, capacity in terms of intellectual processing or information processing. Um, this is my nicely drawn slide um, from uh, inspired by my colleague, Giulio Tononi, um, who's been thinking about this a lot in the context of consciousness and um, the ability to uh, form associations, functional associations, um, given a uh, deterministic causal structure. So for example, in this particular case, you've got one causal structure where you've got three layers, but there's no connections between items within a layer, which means that um, the processing, if you will, through the system is quite fast, but the number of possible configurations of networks that can exist is actually much more limited than in the system here where you've got a connection within this middle layer. And the number of combinations that can happen in terms of which arrows or which function, which connections are active in a particular point in time can change quite dramatically. And that's an important feature of how the brain works is that you have both what's actually happening in terms of the connections that are engaged for a different pro, but also what could, could potentially happen. So actual and potential configurations, actual, probably a very important characteristic of how the brain is put together. So, um, which brings me to my final slide, which another, what is another um, drawing uh, motivated by my colleague, Julio. Um, and talking about different systems where you've got a very simple network. Um, and in fact, it's, it's basically one node, if you will, or maybe two nodes, uh, photodiode, um, that's just detecting a light. And in this other case, you've got something like a human, like we'll call this human Randy for a lack of a better term. We'll call the photodiode Ernest for, for just to make the differentiation clear. Um, if you present a light to both uh, Ernest and Randy, 
um, both Ernest and Randy will detect the light. And in terms of the dynamics, this could be a single well attractor, this could be a biphasic or a bi well system. Um, so this is getting back to our phase space. So what will happen for Ernest is Ernest will detect the light incredibly quickly. Uh, Randy will do it roughly the same time, maybe somewhat more leisurely because he's a lazy person, but it will, he will <laughs> converge to say that there's a light there. But the difference between um, Ernest and Randy is that Ernest will not know if the light was red, green, or blue. It will not know that that was not a tone. It will not know that the light does not have flavor, for example. Whereas Randy will know that this is a, a light, it could be a red light, it could be a blue light. So he'll have that experience, but also be able to know that this experience exists in a much broader potential context of things that could have happened. And that potential is probably the heart of, of how um, the brain has evolved in the sense of having these potentials that both happen and could have happened. And that potential is what sort of is, at least in the theory, is what, what forms the um, qualia of our, of our experience. That the qualia for Ernest, I'm sad to say, is fairly impoverished, whereas the qualia for Randy is somewhat less impoverished. So the importance of being Ernest is that Ernest is fast, but Randy um, can do more stuff, at least in theory. So with that, I'll leave you with those thoughts and turn the uh, mic over to Michael. Thanks, Randy. Um, Michael, do you want to wrap things up and explain everything to us? Oh, sure. Let me see if I can just get my slides up for starters. Can you all see all that? See those? Yeah. All right. So um, what I did is given the time allotted, I tried to paint a big picture. Um, so with, fortunately, Danny and Lauren and Randy went through a number of details that will, that will make the strategy uh, less stupid, I hope. So I'm gonna move fairly quickly just so I can get through in the allotted time. But um, so there are some in the likely event that in eight to 10 minutes, I don't say anything coherent. There are some references where this material is coming from. Um, you can look at those or ask me about them. So um, here's an overview. I'm just trying to sort of thematically connect these topics. There's a, in philosophy and in neuroscience. So there's a crazy number of different notions of emergence and causation levels and all these things running around in neuroscience and in philosophy. And there have been for a very long time. Uh, so as the former speakers have done, we have to be really careful what we mean about these things. Historically, there's been a, you know, lots of debates and skirmishes between groups of people who called themselves mechanists and emergentists, holists, and so on. The names stayed the same, the positions changed somewhat over time. And we see these debates continuing in various ways up until the current moment. Uh, we have the, the group called neo-mechanists in philosophy of science, philosophy of biology, and neuroscience. And they have, as uh, some of the former speakers pointed out, they have emphasized localization and decomposition as being uh, characteristic of mechanistic explanation and painted that as a relatively kind of reductionist view. Some of us have been pushing back on a variety of features of neo-mystic, neo-mechanistic accounts, including localization and decomposition. You heard some of that already. My work in particular is on multi-scale modeling using network neuroscience. So uh, that's just, you know, you, you've already seen some of this network stuff, fortunately. So um, what I try to do is defend a particular kind of emergence that I think is actually exhibited in neuroscience and in cognitive science more generally. I'm not gonna go through all these points, but um, I, I call it contextual emergence. And it's a type of scientific explanation that emphasizes the equal fundamentality uh, of, of what are often multi-scale contextual constraints and interdependent relations at multiple interacting scales. Uh, they can, we, I, I'm, I'm writing a book, we have a book coming out with Oxford, uh, Robert Bishop and myself, we talk about stability conditions and we have a whole formal account of this, which I'll spare you, but um, suffice it to say that, and, and constraints are now popping up a lot, Bechtel and Winning and Anderson. And so there's a lot of this stuff floating around out there. Um, and I talk about constraints and contextuality. Uh, 
But uh, I think the important thing to emphasize is these constraints, while they sometimes can be causal mechanical, uh, very often they're topological, dimensional, graphical, et cetera. You saw some of that already. And I, I think there are a lot of cases of that. I think they can be even more abstract. Uh, there can be you know, adynamical difference makers, conservation law, free energy principles, least action principles. And while a lot of that sounds like physics, of course, we know there's plenty of that stuff in neuroscience now. Um, so such constraints can also include not only network properties, topological properties, but global organizing principles such as plasticity, robustness, robustness, autonomy, and so on. So I won't go through all of it, but um, you get the idea. So uh, why do I believe contextual emergence is a real thing in neuroscience? And when I say neuroscience, of course, I mean both as a theory of explanation and in the brain and in other complex biological systems. Obviously, everything I'm saying here applies not just to brains, but to developmental biology and so on. So again, you already got um, some good stuff about networks. Obviously, we could spend hours and hours talking about the formal properties of networks, but we all know that there are these networks that come up very often, small world and rich club networks. And you can see some of the sort of topological properties that they have and why people believe that they are efficient, robust, autonomous, and so on. And uh, so one of the things that I write about is that these networks appear, they're ubiquitous across a number of species. They occur, they come into being early in the development of individual organisms. Um, and you, you've already heard some about their properties. So these networks um, that have particular topological features, um, and of course there are other kinds of networks as well, they are, I would say, very common now in every area of neuroscience. So sometimes when I focus on these networks as a case study, I get accused of cherry picking. Um, but I think it's safe to say that uh, the central theoretical unit of study and analysis is multi-scale networks across the board. So obviously there's no time to talk about them all now, but default mode network, right? Executive control network there. I could just go on and on. This, this is a very common mode of explanation now. Um, and so it's, it's in many areas, at least in what I'm gonna call systems neuroscience, it's the primary unit of investigation. And again, multi-scale, often global. Uh, and what are the key features of these networks that in part lead me to describe it in terms of contextual emergence? Well, again, multi-scale, the scales and components and their complex interactions often include the following, obviously ionic flux, subcellular structures, proteins, genes, RNA, neurons and neural assemblies, glia cells, neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, hormones, large-scale neural synchrony, neural oscillations, and possibly even electrical fields. So, um, I mean, we're, we're all sort of, you know, becoming aware of all, 